I'm Anna Webb. Welcome to A Dog's Life. Hey, Mr Binks, you know how, mm, how to put this politely, you had them already chopped off when you came to live with us. There's lots of debate now in the world of veterinary science as to whether that really was a good idea or not. Well, this is why we're jumping on Zoom now to head to Denmark to speak to Dr. Lise Hansen, who has written the amazing book, The Complete Book of Cat and Dog Health, in which she postulates that keeping a male dog and a female dog entire is better for their long-term health. Oh, Dr. Lise Hansen, thank you so much for coming back on A Dog's Life. Thank you for having me again. It's lovely to be here. Well, I think there's lots to talk about. I mean, I, I've loved our episodes. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, there are four episodes in our back catalogue with Dr. Lees on a range of subjects, including the subject we're going to chat about today and stay focused on, aren't we, Lees? Which is yes. to neuter or not to neuter. Indeed. And we we have talked about this before. And I meant to check how long ago that was. I'm not sure. Uh, it's it's a couple of years ago, isn't it? Three. Um, it's no, it's it's over three years. Is which it believe, really? It really is. Yeah, because the podcast launched in March 2020. So I think the uh, neutral not to neuter first episode you know, it was around about then, March or April, so of 2020. And, you know, in that time, the world of dogs has taken such a change, shall we say, putting it perhaps a bit on the polite side. I mean, dogs have just exploded. Well, the whole world has taken a, a well, I mean, <laughs> it's been a weird three years, hasn't it, since we talked about this topic before? Um, absolutely. And 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 talking about neutering is as relevant today as it was three years ago, if not more. Um, I think it's important to say when we talk about neutering, just, just to begin with, just to make it really clear that when I talk about neutering, I talk about the health implications for an individual dog. You know, what will what will happen to the health of my dog, male or female, if we neuter or if we don't neuter? I'm not talking about the, you know, population control. I'm not talking about human humans irresponsible, you know, I mean, there's so much wrong about the way humans interact with dogs in terms of, you know, puppy farms and filled shelters and and irresponsible breeding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's that's a separate issue is, is all I'm trying to say. I think when we talk about neutering, we're talking about um, a dog in the hands of a responsible owner, whether whether or not to neuter. If, to be honest, if I can be blunt, uh, I would say that if you if you can't manage an entire dog, you probably shouldn't have a dog. You know, neutering is not the answer to humans being um, irresponsible and neglecting their dogs. Um, but I'm just going to assume that you're a responsible owner and you want to do what's best for your individual dog. Absolutely. No, I mean, this is brilliant to clarify that. But, you know, in in having just said that, you know, this um, obsession, I think, to spay or neuter has come from the welfare organizations, you know, yeah. campaigning to stop the, initially the stray dog population, which we used to have in England, but we haven't got it anymore. You know, they've got it in Thailand, but they haven't got it. We haven't got it in England. There's no stray dogs roaming the streets. So I haven't seen any lately, you know, so that's not a reason now. To exactly. Mute. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. so Lise, tell, tell me, what are the health benefits, if any, to, if we just say neutering, but it also means spaying, depending on whether your dog's male or female, um, are there any health benefits of doing it? The short answer, the overall answer is not really, um, but there are a lot of risks involved with doing it. Um, but, I mean... It's, we're sort of at a point where everything we everything we used to think has 
turned out not to be correct. So we're at a at a point now, we're sort of in a period of transition where everything is changing, which can be really confusing. Um, and the situation is, I mean, we used to think that sex hormones had to do with making babies, you know, and if we weren't going to breed from our dogs, then we might as well neuter them. Um, it made everything easier. Um, and why not? We weren't really aware of any risks. We were aware of a few side effects, but really it bo boiled down to three things. Um, we knew that neutered dogs could get uh, some some cosmetic change, some coat changes, you know, this sort of uh, unruly, woolly uh, puppy coat. But that was a cosmetic issue um, only. That was one. We knew that many neutered dogs tended to become overweight. And then finally, we knew that about one in five female neutered dogs develop urinary incontinence. But that was really it. And I'm talking in the past tense, but this is, this is, we don't have to go, I mean, this is five to 10 years ago. This is how, this is the, the what was available to us in terms of information. Um, then, there was this watershed article that I keep referring to. I think that, that lots of vets when talking about this will keep referring to, uh, which was an article that was published from the University of California in 2013, uh, which was a complete turning point in our understanding of this topic. Um, and it was following this article that the whole area of neutering suddenly, you know, suddenly it was this immense um focus and there was lots of studies and lots of articles published and as a result of that there is so much knowledge that has become available to us only in the last six or seven years maybe um, and what we know now is that neutering has implications that go far beyond um, reproduction really sexual hormones play a huge part in maintaining health on many fronts can I just briefly explain what it's all about? And, and to be Please. honest, I, I didn't know this five years ago. This is new information. No, Lise, I mean, I'd love that because, you know, the thing is, I often, I mean, this morning I was talking to somebody about what type of dog would best suit their family. And we were on the Kennel Club Assured Breeders website together and, you know, all the rest of it. Now, you know, in the next, they'll get their puppy and they'll go for their second vaccination. And at that point, Point, I know what happens the vet will say well right shall we book you in for a spay or neuter at six months well please don't say that <laughs> well, well this, this is what you know people are saying yeah. you know this um and then you know some people come back to me and say I know I don't know I'm, I'm not sure I want to spay is this right you know what what do I do the vet's being very pushy about it so you know I know this whole new science has come out in the paper and the studies, but I know you know it takes a long time for things to filter through, but yeah. how long is it going to take to filter through? I know. Because I do feel, I do feel that it's counterintuitive perhaps for some vets, depending, I think, on the practice. You know, I, I chatted with Dr. Jean Dodds not long ago, on also on tighter testing, actually, Lise, which I know oh, is another. Oh, lucky you. Yeah, yeah. I, know, I know. It was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. And I highlighted to Jean that vets are charging £400 in London for a tighter test, right, which is a bit prohibitive, particularly at the moment. And I mentioned it to Jean, and, you know, she was cross. But apparently in New York, it's kind of the same. That I know, I know, and this, I mean, what what we're all about is helping pet carers make informed health decisions, isn't it? Being aware of the the science that's available. I mean, and that's 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 why we're talking today, and that's what you're doing through your wonderful pod podcast. And it is so important that we help get this information out there. And I think the thing, the thing to understand and the thing to talk to your local vet about the, the reason I say please don't say that is because I so hope that it is the exception in 2023 that a vet will say you know let's book them in for a neuter at six months it shouldn't be happening like that anymore um, it shouldn't be the rule anyway and I, I hope it isn't but but if it happens the thing to discuss with your vet is the hormone 
this that um this is all about the hormone that we refer to as LH, luteinizing hormone LH. And if I can just put it into, into context briefly, because I'm going to be saying gonads a lot. Uh, so let me just <laughs> let me just define what we're talking about. The gonads are the internal sex organs, yeah? So it's the testicles in a male and the ovaries in a female. And they produce the sex hormones, testosterone in a male and estrogen followed by progesterone in a female. Um, and the way that happens in a healthy entire dog um, is through this amazing, finely regulated, clever feedback system between the brain and the gonads. So the brain stimulates the gonads into producing sex hormones. Um, and when um, when the, sec the level of sex hormones rise, there's a negative feedback that goes back to the brain saying we've got enough now so you can make less of this stimulation hormone, which is LH. So the pituitary gland in the brain um, releases LH, which then tells the testicles or the ovaries to produce sex hormones. That's the normal system. That's how nature has designed it. When we then neuter an animal, we... we surgically remove the gonads. We take away the testicles when we castrate a male dog and we take away the ovaries, um, sometimes the ovaries and the uterus when we um, neuter a female dog. And when we do that, the feedback system is obviously broken. So the brain doesn't receive that, that negative feedback saying we have enough sex hormones now, you don't have to keep producing LH to stimulate the gonads. So the pituitary gland keeps producing LH and you end up, and this is the case for all neutered uh, animals, you end up with extremely high levels of LH all the time, forever. Uh, and the levels go way beyond the level that they would ever reach in a in a healthy, balanced entire animal, you get uh, LH levels that are 30 times what they would normally ever reach. Um, you could almost say it's like the brain is knocking on the door. You know, it keeps trying to stimulate the gonads into producing sex hormones, uh, but they never will because they're not there anymore. Gosh. And, and what has, what <laughs> I know, I mean, and, and what, what we, I say we, I've not discovered anything, I've just studied this, but what scientists have discovered is that there are um, LH receptors all over the body. There's LH receptors in white blood cells, in the skin, in the hair follicles, in the thyroid gland, um, all over the body, many, many tissues in the body, many different types of tissues in the body have LH receptors. So when you have an individual with 30 times the normal level of LH constantly, forever, for the rest of their life, that starts causing changes in tissues all over the body. Uh, and that's the that's the explanation behind um, the, all this this increased risk of disease that we see in neutered animals. And the consequence of this is that neutered animals have um, a much higher risk of developing cancer, um, developing osteoarthritis, develop, developing ligament disease, uh, typically um, cruciate ligament um, disease in the knees, um, immune mediated diseases, so that's your allergies and your autoimmune disease, diseases, and thyroid disease. Um, thyroid disease, you know, hypothyroidism and underfunctioning thyroid is a very, very common problem in dogs. Um, and it turns out that the single biggest risk factor for thyroid disease in a dog is being neutered. Wow. So, so there's all these dogs who have to take medication for the rest of their life because of thyroid disease. And it's for many of them, it's purely because the, they were neutered. But until very recently, we had no idea of this correlation. We simply didn't know. But now now we do. 
So how many papers, um, Lee's, you know, have been written on this and, and where have they been published? Is it being circulated, for example, by the World Small Animal Veterinary Association or the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, for example, here in the UK? You, because why then does it seem to me that vets still really want to spay or neuter? It's a, such a good question. And I, I don't have a good answer. I think that probably is probably a combination of lots of different answers. Um, change takes time. Mm. And like I said, this information is only, I mean, the very first indication that neutering could be harmful that I ever came across was 10 years ago. Um, and then followed all these art articles that, you know, confirmed it and gave us lots more detail. Um, so you could say this information is, is six, seven years old, which is not that long. And I suppose it hasn't been the smoothest cup. You know, lots of other stuff has been going on in the world, um, also in veterinary practice in the last few years, which may have slow down this this transition but it is a very hot topic in veterinary circles certainly among researchers and scientists but i think you can still find vets in practice who haven't who haven't heard um i don't think that would be the case you said it was three years ago that we since talked about this in mm -hmm. another three years i'm prepared to bet you nobody will be neutering routinely anymore i mean this is something that's being discussed but but it needs to be discussed more, which is which is again, which is why we're here. I mean, one thing is is it's the one thing the harm that we caused inadvertently in the past before we knew better. That is what it is. We can't blame ourselves, even though, you know, it weighs heavily on some of us having neutered animals that that we caused harm. We didn't certainly didn't mean to, but we did. But now that we know, and I suppose we in this context is, I don't know, humanity, the veterinary profession, the the the, the information is available now. Um, it's really hard to defend a practice that, that ignores it. Mm, no, indeed, indeed. I mean, that's in a way the whole point of science, isn't it, really, Lise? Yes. A bit like the, you know, the science of nutrition. It changes almost every day. There's a new discovery. I mean, I always quote coconut oil as the example. I mean, 10 years ago, nobody thought coconut oil was good for anything. But indeed, it's good for lots, not least cognitive function and skin issues, for example. But it used to be thrown away with the coconuts. You know, it was like... Like, why do you want coconut oil? So I understand about all of this. But gosh, it does worry me. I'm just sitting here looking at Mr. Binks, my little toy terrier. You see, he he arrived neutered and I'm freaking out now. <laughs> Whereas Prudence, who's by my feet, she remains unneutered, Lise, partly because of having done all my study when I took Prudence on and understanding actually already that you keep the animal whole because Molly was spayed in fairness, at three, but I don't think it really matters. Many people have all these ideas, don't they, with, with bitches anyway. Let's focus on bitches for a minute, that, you know, there's all this school of thought now that it's perfectly fine to neuter after you let your bitch have one season, then you spay, and then it's going to be all right. Or some other people say, let them have three seasons and then spay, and the impact will potentially be less. What do you think of that? I think the jury is out um, in terms of we know that, I mean, when, first of all, when we talk about risk, it easily becomes very confusing um, when, we, when we're really, if we're interested in one individual, you know, you can have a neutered animal that lives a long, healthy life and, and never get sick with, with anything. Um, we, we're simply talking risk and the risk of developing all of these diseases is much higher in neutered animals. However, there are some variables that we don't understand yet. We don't, there are some breed differences that have not been uh, completely understood. You know, neutering has, um, is, is, is more of a dangerous game in some breeds than it is in others. Um, Particularly as when you talk about cancer, if you if you um, if you've got a breed that already has a higher than average cancer risk, neutering really becomes um, 
hazardous for lack of a better word uh, whereas in other breeds the cancer risk may be so small to begin with that even if you double it it's not going to it's still not going to be very likely uh, so mm. so risk is risk is always a difficult thing to to understand intuitively i i find the things we don't know um we know that there are breed differences uh we don't know we don't understand those completely yet but there certainly are breed differences and the other unknown is the age at which we neuter um i've not seen any newer studies that have um finally been able to kind of quantify that and and the only the only conclusions i've seen so far is that it doesn't it doesn't seem to play a role whether you neuter young or late it's not it's not about delaying neutering it's about not neutering at all right um okay because it, it's just quite interesting because you know i mean having a bitch that's not spayed is quite unusual still i'll be honest with you lise so i think a lot of pet parents find it a hassle the blood and you know the whole period type of thing and perhaps having to worry about particularly if people don't really walk their dog regularly themselves they're relying on dog walkers and that's a risk you can't let a dog on heat be walked by a dog walker and the sort of more logistical things from from a female dog perspective so I, I'm quite rare to be honest that Prue is now nearly eight and just had her eighth season you know and it was interesting Lise because obviously am I right in thinking dogs do go through the menopause like us no no they don't they they continue having the, the hormonal cycle throughout throughout their life um, and you're absolutely right that you are in a minority, an informed minority. Um, about 75% of female dogs in the UK are neutered. So it's only about a quarter of all female dogs who are entire. And and I mean, in 10 years, that will be a completely different story. But that's the situation now. And of course, now that we know that neutering is not safe, we need to get used to living with entire animals. And it is a different, it is a different story. I mean, it may be that that if you're used to having males and female dogs together, that that that's an impractical thing, you know, uh, mm. unless you can, I mean, the female comes into heat. Um, I mean, there are always, of course, um, huge individual variations, but roughly speaking, a female comes into heat twice a year, um, and, and is fertile for about two weeks, actually less than that, but needs to be kept isolated for about two weeks. Yeah. Um, so if you have male and female dogs, you probably need to board the male for a couple of weeks, twice a, twice a year, um, unless you can be absolutely certain to keep them apart. Uh, and you certainly need to keep your female dog on a lead for for a couple of weeks, twice a year. Absolutely. Um, no, I know. Or be lucky enough to have a garden. And just think that, you know, certainly there's that one week, isn't there, of the three when they're on heat that is, you know, that really dangerous week when they sure. probably... I mean, for me, I, I don't find that aspect too much of a problem. Oh, there's prudence <laughs> shaking. But, but, but it's interesting, you know, vets will say we've well, got to spay. I'm going somewhere this. So I've, I've, for the first time in my life, I have lived through prudence having um, a massive, a masuvo false pregnancy of massive proportions um which shocked me you know because i've never experienced it before she literally went down with mastitis oh damn um, that's oh, yeah. quite uncommon right well then this is interesting okay i'm going somewhere that might be a bit rupert sheldrake for you in a minute Lise. but um <laughs> my cat gremlin that i adored more than anything i'll be honest part sadly due to being poisoned by fox poison it was oh, awful dear. i'm oh, sorry God. to hear that no thank you it was very fast it was all misdiagnosed initially and it was very fast basically um uh, four weeks and if i'd only known he was only going to live for four weeks you know i Things I would have not done that and I wouldn't have, you know, mind you, I was here all the time, really, because he wasn't well. However, when he passed, Prudence came into season, right, Lise, on the 9th of March, because it was the first day of Crufts. And I just breathed a huge sigh of relief that I hadn't arranged to take her with me, um, mm. because that would have been dreadful um, for the other dogs. So it was the 9th of March. Gremlin passed on the 6th of June. So literally, I think it was about four days later. So a good three months after she came into heat, which should be your 
kind of all clear period, really, in terms of thinking, let, yeah. we don't need to look out for a pyometra, you, you know, we're, it's clear. And this huge false pregnancy developed. The vets actually were brilliant because we were really worried. I was really worried about a pyometra occurring as a result, but it didn't. They gave regular ultrasounds, you know, on her area and it, there was no infection of the uterus. But, you know, yes, I mean, so much milk coming out, it was grim and it lasted for about 10 days. She had to go on antibiotics and then at the same time, she developed this weird skin infection, totally mad. And the vet was a bit worried it was a cancerous lump, but it wasn't. But she had to have it, uh, the pus, you know, cultured. And we had to get quite an unusual human antibiotic. You won't believe this. So gremlins passed. I'm freaking out. Meanwhile, Prudence is going through all this stuff. Anyway, her lumps went down. So... Could her false pregnancy have been triggered by shock to have lost gremlin and going through some weird, rare for prudence, um, emotional experience? Well, rare for anybody, I think. It, it sounds like, and it sounds like more than a false pregnancy. I mean, if she had skin changes, um, and, you know, it's not normally uh, associated with a false pregnancy. Um, so it's it's it sounds remarkably. I mean, she was well. Yes. When Gremlin died and then within four days, there was all sorts of stuff wrong with her. Yes. yes it sounds correct. like quite a dramatic um, stress, grief reaction to me. Mm, mm, mm. I know, I know, because the vet was, you know, sort of, you know, didn't really comment on that. And then when we were there having one of her ultrasounds on her on her fanny, as I always call it. You know, I happened to say, where's Gremlin? And then the strangest thing happened. She pulled me to the room that I didn't know was where they kept the ashes. And no one had told me Gremlin's ashes had been returned literally the evening before. And, um, yeah, she smelt Gremlin's ashes, which I thought was impossible because, obviously, do they smell? Who knows? It's really out out to the jury. But I learned that in Australia in 2018, they trained a team of dogs to find cremains, you know, when all the wildfires wiped out loads of properties and, and humans at the same time and um, grief stricken relatives wanted to find some evidence you know some memory and the dogs would find certain ashes kind of quite a depressing subject we've moved on to quite quickly sorry <laughs> you know. about this but it's just fascinating and and Adam the vet who I'm actually really you know just massive you know thanks to Adam Wolf who's Australian and really good actually um Lee's and coped with me extremely well you know he kind of rolls his eyes when I mention homeopathy but that's fine but he was very happy for me to offer Gremlin an integrative approach with the help of Barbara actually and even happy for him to be fed on raw food and all sorts of things so that was really really game-changing for me because it's actually a first uh, um to be honest where traditional conventional vet has embraced you know some alternative therapies and indeed raw food feeding for one so that was exciting um it's just a shame so yeah so poor prudence so she's all right now her boobs have shrunk back and there's no milk but you know she's the least maternal dog in the world breeding a litter from prudence was never going to happen Lise, ever in a million years and i'm proof that a dog can remain entire and you don't get puppies it's quite easy not to have puppies with this well, exactly with an entire and, bitch yeah and and that's the that's the point you know it's very very it's it's easy to have entire animals um yeah and not let them breed you just have to you know take proper precautions when the when the females are in heat okay so um, another misnomer i'd like to talk about is intact males people have this again uh, misconception i'd say that you know an intact male dog is definitely going to be more aggressive than a neutered one <laughs> well I think there's only one uh, situation where that, I mean, an intact male, the changes are going to be, an intact male is going to be uh, sniffing more, urine marking more. So a walk may happen more slowly. You know, they'll be more interested in in, in sniffing and peeing on everything. Um, they may be more aggressive towards other males when there are females in heat around. That's the only form of in, of aggression that may be increased in a male dog. Um, they'll they there will maybe some competition for females, but general aggression or general reactivity 
um, is believed to be increased in neutered animals. Yes. Um, it- there, there are. I was talking about these LH receptors before um, that are present in in lots and lots of organs and cause mayhem uh, when the levels get really high in neutered animals. And they are also present in in parts of the brain, hippocampus and hypothalamus, which are the areas of the brain that have to do with fear and aggression. Um, and it has been demonstrated that that neutered animals are more likely to be fearful and more likely to be aggressive. And of course, most aggression in dogs is, in anybody, I suspect, is, is fear-based. Um, so, so these problems, generally speaking, the, the problems will be worse in neutered animals than in entire animals uh, when we're talking about male dogs, with the exception of aggression towards other male dogs over yes. females. Absolutely. But aggression towards humans um, is, or aggression sort of overall, um, is less in in um, entire males than in neutered males. And you know, it's all about training. <laughs> well, of course, of course, <laughs> and socialization, and having the ability to get the focus of your dog, and um, and all of that, and of course, a lot of reactivity and fear is trained um, by not responding in. a in an appropriate way to your dog in various contexts unwittingly normally with 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 um pet parents i would say um in terms of their thinking of their dog as a little person in a fur coat of course and it's all about um i mean this is a wider subject but it's all about um having animals that feel safe in their environment um, and and you know like like you say training um, to feel safe in all situations and to know to look to your owners um, if you ever feel unsafe rather than than you know reacting and going out there uh, yourself. But that's I mean that's another very interesting topic that you know more about than I do. But but I mean absolutely absolutely. But but it is it is not true at all in general terms to think that entire animals are more aggressive on the contrary actually and in a way it so makes sense to be on the contrary because as as you say you know it's a whole animal we need everything to work integratively in our bodies and it, it is a fascinating subject which leads you know obviously to to something I say to people quite often. Well, if you lived in Norway, you wouldn't be having this conversation with your vet in the first place. And why is that, Lise? Well, this is the other really interesting aspect of this of this subject is that, and, and it's in a way it demonstrates that neutering, the idea that we should neuter has very little to do with dog health and it has very little to do with population control it has a lot to do with cultural norms um across the globe the approach to this has been completely different historically and and still is to this day in america um almost all dogs are neutered and it it's almost become a sort of mantra as i understand it that you must spay and neuter your dogs to be a, a responsible pet parent um, and it's it's highly uh, unusual to have a, a dog as a pet who is not neutered. Um, in the UK, about 70% of dogs are neutered. Um, in my native Denmark, it's less than half that are neutered, but still a significant proportion. But in other parts of Scandinavia, um, Norway particularly, almost no dogs are neutered. It's illegal to neuter for other than health reasons in Norway. Uh, so, you know, 90, I don't know, 98, 99% of dogs are entire in Norway. And the numbers in Sweden are not very different, even though it's not illegal in Sweden, it's just considered unusual and unethical to neuter a dog. Um, so it's it, it's it certainly demonstrate that it's perfectly possible uh, to live with entire dogs it's not a problem and it doesn't really you know it doesn't lead to streets filled with with stray dogs or or you know it's 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 a perfectly normal um state of affairs but when you talk to americans about this it's shocking to them 
Um, which is why another thing that we should maybe mention is um, uh, something that we talked about uh, published scientific journals before. And one, one area that um, where I see a lot of, of articles published at the moment is alternative surgical procedures to traditional neutering, um, which is um, to, to do a vasectomy on uh, male dogs or to do a hysterectomy on female dogs, but leave um, the uterus in place. So that means the dogs will not be able to re reproduce, but they will hormonally still be uh, entire. Um, and I think that's going to be the way in America because they are so culturally uncomfortable with the idea of dogs that are uh, able to reproduce. But so that's going to be a sort of halfway house, I think, at least for a while. Um, but there's a lot of talk about that at the moment as well. But that's very interesting. But surely by taking the ovaries out of a bitch, surely that's the hormones. No, they don't. So if I said that, I'm sorry, then I said it wrong. If that's what I said, they take the uterus, but leave the home, leave oh, the ovaries. Oh, right. OK, right. Oh, they leave the it's, oh. it's, 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 it's often referred to as the ovary sparing spay. Um, ah. it, it, it takes out the uterus, which means that the dog can obviously not become pregnant and cannot get a, a, a pyometra, a womb infection. Mm. Uh, but hormonally, uh, she's completely entire still. Right. I think I think it in America when you speak to American vets and um, American scientists, this is to them, this is what we will be doing in the future. We will no longer be doing a normal spay. We'll be doing an ovary sparing spay instead. To me, I think it's an unnecessary step. Why not just leave the animals entire? But for those that are very uncomfortable with the risk of pyometra and very uncomfortable with the risk of, you know, unintended mating, it can be a, a compromise, I suppose. Yes, I mean, you know, I mean, with this very recent Lee's situation with Prudence, you know, I have been thinking, and I said to the vet, you know, should I spay Prudence now? And, you know, he just went, yes, Hannah, yes, please, yes, please. And I'm thinking, hmm, well, I'm going to think about it. Um, I wonder why he would say that. I mean, I don't think what you've been through is in any way a normal false pregnancy. It sounds more like it was some sort of acute physical reaction on lots of fronts. But but it doesn't sound like a typical false pregnancy to me. And even if even I mean, false pregnancies, um, we can if we got time, we can talk about false pregnancies. But they are um, a normal phase that every dog has hormonally uh, following her her season or her heat. Um, some dogs it's quite pronounced. Some dogs, you hardly notice it at all, or you don't notice it at all. But it's not unhealthy. You know, it's not a disease. It's not no. pathological. It is a normal phase. But just like in, in women, normal hormonal variations um, can affect some to the point where they become unwell. You can see that in dogs as well. Some dogs become uh, very lethargic, don't want to leave the house, become obsessed with the idea of puppies. Um, and th there are uh, ways to treat that. I would never neuter a dog, even if um, even if false pregnancies are um, an issue. There are other ways to deal with that. Yes, yes. And it's and it, I think, you know, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Lisa, generally this false pregnancy phase of the season tends to happen in the second or the month after the initial three weeks. So, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, this was way after that. Yeah. So yeah. I just I just I, I can't figure it out at all. It's rather extraordinary. Or my other thought on it, Lisa, and, you know, you'll kind of raise your eyebrows now. I think it might have been <laughs> gremlin paying Prudence back for being a bit of an idiot um, <laughs> in the last six months, you know, actually, she's been a bit of an idiot because the power of cats, you know, and their attunement, if you like, to the sixth sense anyway, you know, because then last Saturday I'm rushing because I have to get to the Blondie concert. I'm really excited. So we go out for our walk very early and guess what happens? Prudence manages suddenly after eight years of never having a grass seed in her ear, 
a grass seed, penetrates her ear, and it's obviously quite bad. Head shaking, freaking out, her eyes have gone red. I'm thinking, I don't believe this. So basically, we get you know home, I drive straight to the vet. She has minor ear surgery straight away. It's all fine. And you think, well, why has that happened now? But I probably overthink things, don't I, Lise? <laughs> well, I don't know about that one. But but it is, I mean, it is true that when you talk about Gremlin's death and Prudence reacting in that way, is that that grief and stress can make us ill. Um, mm. it, 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 I don't think there's any doubt about that. Dogs, cats or humans. Yes. So I, yes. I think it was a I think it was a, a freak thing you had there rather than a a typical false pregnancy episode for sure. Okay, cool. So um, your advice is hold fire, just yeah. keep prudence as as she is and no need to spay even though she's eight. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I mean, I think, I think this is, that's certainly my advice, but I think it is an important point to make that, that this is obviously not my personal opinion we're talking about i'm just a vet i'm not someone who's done you know i'm not the, the one of the scientists who's uncovered all of this but there is a, a, a all the papers that are coming out at the moment um there is a consensus on this you know this is about high levels of lh causing all sorts of um disease some of it life-threatening and and as a result of that, we need to change our ways. Um, what all I'm trying to say is that it's not so much personal opinion; it's really the science is available now. Yes. And 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 there is, I mean, you were saying before how some vets will still recommend the old way, and and I think there is some. I don't know. I'm searching for words here, but I mean, I think I think humans are possibly conservative by nature you know we are slow to change our ways and we are prone to do things for no other reason than this is what we've always done um and that is is clearly in nobody's interest i mean you know the earth would be flat if if we didn't change <laughs> our our <laughs> views according to science yes. uh, we need to adapt new scientific inf information as it is made available to us and we need to act um also when we take care of the animals um that that you know we are in our care we need to act according to facts and according to the current science and not according to outdated beliefs that's Indeed. that's that's really yeah. that's really my my point here yes absolutely and i think you know um just to promote well-being and overall natural health. I think this is this is the mantra that, or well, certainly I live in my little bubble about this, but um, I do think it's becoming more accessible and pet parents who are that way inclined themselves, you know, are now really transferring their values of diet and, you know, lifestyle choices to to their pets um and with good reason and you know we can do that now because there's so much more choice out there as well you know in terms of foods anyway and um you know alternative therapies that well they've been there for a very long time um but um they're being talked about more which is great because then that helps change happen sure but also i think it's important to to separate this issue from however one feels about alternative therapies because it's not a you know it's not an alternative view um it is where mainstream veterinary science is at at the moment um and and it can be difficult to as a as a lay person wanting to stay informed you know social media etc it, it it's great but it's also it can be quite overwhelming and it seems that you know everyone is free to have an opinion about stuff these days but but if we go to the science if we go to the scientific references um what it boils down to is that if you take away the sex organs you end up with dangerously high levels of lh which cause all sorts of problems um that's that's what we know about this topic at the moment and i'm sure in another 5 or 10 years we'll we'll will be able to you know say more specifically 
um, about the areas that are still not completely uncovered. But at the moment, what we know is that neutering is not safe the way we thought it was safe only five or 10 years ago. Well, Lise, look, thank you. This is going to be real food for thought, I know, for lots of people. <laughs> so I really, really appreciate your time to come on and um, talk about this, because indeed we've talked more about the subject than three years ago. And I think it's all down to the LH hormone, which I'm just fascinated about. That's interesting. Very interesting. Mm. Thank you, Lise. It's a pleasure. It's great to speak to you. Yes, we'll do another one soon too. <laughs> yes. That's our show, Mr. Binks. What did you think? Oh no, don't go into a bit of a freak out. You're very well and you're 11. And you're right, it is time for Woof of the Week. The interesting thing about science is through time it changes. One of these things now being discussed in the vet profession is whether to neuter or not to neuter. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, go on, rate and review the show wherever you tune into your podcasts. Thanks again, of course, to Dr. Lise Hansen for joining us today. And please note that links to the complete book of cat and dog health are all in the show notes. Thanks, of course, to Mike Hansen, my producer, for all the music and production as ever. Also, Mr. Binks? Yes, you're right. We will be back in your feed next Sunday. So why don't you subscribe now? And that way you'll never miss another show. Bye for now. Bye.